Hey yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to the Old Culture Podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the D program. Thanks for being here. And just when you thought it was safe to turn on the old self-grappling show, we are venturing back into the dark side of occultism with Jason Horsley. Jason was here just a couple episodes ago talking about the first half of his new book, The Vice of Kings, how socialism, occultism, and the sexual revolution engineered a culture of abuse. Now that chat focused primarily on the Fabian society and their brand of socialism and how it has shaped or at least helped shape modern society and the culture of abuse that seems to have grown up in it. And this time around, Jason and I are going to dig a bit deeper into the role occultism plays in this, particularly the brand of occultism made popular by Aleister Crowley. We also touch on the uh, left-hand path as social engineering and Crowley's influence on Timothy Leary and Wicca. It is quite a thought-provoking chat, so make of it what you will, pun intended. And of course, any healthy discourse and discussion is encouraged, and any unhealthy discourse or discussion is discouraged. So, Anyways, Jason Horsley is back in the house, right after this. The time has come to unshackle the beast that you have feared for so long. Relinquish your fear and submit to the cause. You will find all you need in these audio recordings. The year is 1990. Welcome to a culture. Jason Horsley, long time, no chat. Welcome back to the show, man. Thanks, Ryan. Glad that we got to do part two. Absolutely, me too. We actually got a pretty good response to the last episode we did just a couple of weeks back, uh, both on Patreon and the YouTube comments were surprisingly uh, positive as well. And uh, right, if you... I haven't checked those out. I must check them out. But yeah, surprisingly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, I mean, a few people asked me both on Patreon, I think there was a YouTube commenter as well that said, to get you back on as soon as I could, and here we are. I have some things I would like to get to that we didn't touch on from the last chat, but before we get to those things, Jason, could you maybe briefly catch people up and summarize the thesis of your latest book, Vice of Kings, just as a reminder, so we can sort of reset the stage for this chat? Right. My This is my... Uh, the opposite of a forte, whatever that is, I find it most difficult to condense and summarize. So um, it's about social engineering. It's about systematized, organized child abuse and how it overlaps with progressive politics in Britain specifically, but also extending into the U.S. and probably other continents via these, these various Fabian agendas, Fabian society with a lot of reference to Jimmy Savile, the infamous DJ and uh, sexual predator in Britain. And then in part two of the book, it extends into the more deeply into the area of occultism by looking at the work of Aleister Crowley. Absolutely, yeah. And Jimmy Savile is not a name that we actually mentioned at all in the first chat that we did, which is surprising because there is a lot of detail in there about him, and he's a pretty well-known person in these circles. And yeah. your family, if I, re- if I recall correctly, 
had some connections to this guy. Could you outline that for us? How he was, I guess, networking in the in the same groups. Well, it, it was it was perhaps a little tenuous. I mean, I mean, Jimmy Savile. For anyone who knows much about him, he he got around. I mean, he really seemed to know everybody, everyone who was anyone. And you know, there's plenty of, I think, legitimate speculation that he was involved in. In, in child sex trafficking and pornography and procuring children for the elites. And, well, I've got no reason to think that, that he was involved in anything like that with my family, but he was involved, or my family business was involved with him just uh, at least on one occasion, which was the famous Land's End, John O'Groats Land's End charity run he did, which is a, a very long run over several days, I guess it was, and my family business, Northern Foods, actually fueled that run, fueled Jimmy on his run by providing a truck full of food and drink and whatnot that drove behind him for the for the whole length of that run. So it's just, you know, how it, how it is when you're looking through masses of evidence and then you just find a lead like that. It, it, it can be very shocking and surprising. And Prior to that, the only reason I had to think that my family knew Jimmy Savile personally rather than just knew of him, which everybody did, was that my sister had his autograph. And I don't know if it was signed to her name or not, probably not, but my father got Jimmy Savile's autograph supposedly at random when he ran into Jimmy Savile on an airplane. That was the story. But then I found out while investigating this that Jimmy Savile claimed that he never flew. Apparently he was afraid of flying or he just was against it or whatever the reason. So, of course, that left me wondering if my father's account was actually accurate and he might have known Jimmy Savile in other circles that he didn't want to mention, but I, I have no concrete evidence to suggest that. Just That's just uh, one of those many question marks that I was left with at the end of this investigation. Yeah, I mean, there were probably more questions than answers in the book and... You know, let's just get right to, I guess, part two of the book. You called it the Crowley joke. And I was curious if you could explain what you mean by that phrase exactly, because it's not, you know, it's not really clear to somebody who just picks up the book what you mean by that, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's it's actually it does segue right from Jimmy Savile, because as I've mentioned elsewhere, and as I think I do touch on in the book, uh, Jimmy Savile did use humor and joking and, and satire and what have you uh, as a way to conceal his crimes, his behaviors, by advertising them in the context of jokes. And I've later come to understand and even heard people refer to this, people who've had experience of it, that it is, does seem to be one of the methods within the circles of the elite uh, organized crime uh, specifically around this this area of, of child trafficking and child sexual abuse and pornography, but probably uh, in other areas too, is to make jokes about it when uh, in a company in which it's not clear like who who's in on it and who isn't. So meeting new people in these circles, one way to gauge if they're open to recruitment, if you will, or or to, or to temptation is to make jokes and then gauging the reactions you know, gauging the reactions in order to determine how, how uh, susceptible they will be to temptation and so if somebody is, is is morally offended by jokes about child sexual abuse then it, it's a good chance that they're not going to be receptive to actual serious offers of involvement in those kinds of things so it's possible to see how that joking could actually be strategic in that regard and another way is, is that it, it also deflects attention from from the thing that, that a person is trying to conceal uh, in, in a kind of double bluff, as in he's joking about those things. Maybe there are already rumors about them. He's joking about them. So obviously he doesn't take the rumors seriously and he obviously couldn't possibly be involved in these things because he wouldn't be so brazen as to joke about them. Uh, and... Uh, that was certainly the case with Jimmy Savile, that it was assumed for a long time, at least by those who didn't know that that he was joking he was just joking about them and therefore, you know, he was able he was 
innocent enough in his own mind not to take any rumors seriously, but it later turned out that that wasn't the case. Like there was a, there was a whole different meaning to the jokes. One of the things was also uh, is the kind of blatant showing of power, like to to brag about the things one is doing. And in the case of Jimmy Savile, was in the company of. Uh, on occasion, the, his actual victims would be there, like there are clips of him on TV or on the radio where he's with a child or a teenager or more than one and uh, joking about having his way with them. And, and it turns out that he actually was, or at least was, you know, with with the equivalent thereof. And so you can imagine what that'd be like for a victim to be hearing that, that their abuser's actually joking publicly about what he's doing. That would signal to the victim that, that he was untouchable, that he was he didn't even have to hide it. So then that would that would uh, obviously reduce the chances that they would they would ever talk about it because they would feel that nobody would would do anything about it anyway. It was just a big joke. So bringing it back to to Crowley, there's this very I mean there there are many things around Crowley that he, he had a mischievous sense of humor and that he was he was unconcerned about his public image which isn't true, by the way, because he sued on, on several occasions when, when there were you know, allegations or accusations about him that he didn't like. But the general perception is of somebody who was very ostentatious about his dark side and that he paraded it. My brother was rather like this too. And that included making jokes about various things. But the, the, the joke that I refer to in that title is the joke in quotes that he made in Magic and Theory and Practice about uh, sacrificing children on a regular basis over a period of 15 years or so. And it's in the context of a chapter about ritual sacrifice and the power and meaning of sacrifice with a lot of serious content about the energetic principles around blood sacrifice, whether it's animals, whether it's humans, and uh, referring to history and so on and so forth and black magic and so it's a very serious chapter, but embedded within the chapter is the supposed joke where Crowley writes that he himself has practiced child sacrifice on a regular basis, you know, for, for over a decade. And I think there's a footnote that would have appeared later. I think initially it appeared without any kind of qualification, but later there was a footnote claiming that this was Crowley's little joke about masturbation, as in, you know, when he ejaculates, then all those unborn children are sacrificed. And that the explanation for this, besides Crowley having a mischievous sense of humor, uh, at least as given by Milo Duquette, who I quote in the book, was that uh, it would have been illegal for Crowley to write about masturbation and therefore he had to veil it in this joke reference to child sacrifice, and that many of the passages and the references in that chapter and in other places in Crowley's book were actually veiled references to sex magic, and that Crowley was a sex magician who would never, ever practice anything like blood sacrifice, but he wasn't able to speak freely about sex magic for two reasons, one being that it was this great secret of occultism, and the other being that the times would have forbidden him from doing so openly without being actionable. Now, as you know, if you read the book, I, I break that down and I, I think I demonstrate, well, for my own satisfaction anyway, that that's a, that's a very spurious argument all told for, for what Crowley was up to there. I think he was, he was doing something very different. Yeah, so what actual concrete evidence do we have that Crowley may have been involved in, in what you're claiming he was. Was it just those pages in Magic and Theory and Practice, or are there other examples that you could find or that you could point people to that may, I don't know, I guess either confirm or even deny this? Well, there are different approaches. And, you know, the whole of the second part of the book is dedicated to presenting all the evidence I could find for Crowley's involvement. And none of it involved us, well, I shouldn't say none of it involved a smoking gun because there was the testimony of um, the, uh, oh gosh, you say I'm terrible about remembering my own evidence. Maybe you can help me out. It was the, the founder of Alexandrian Wicca, 
Alex, somebody yeah, who initiated. I ha- hold on, I, I may have a note here about that. He, he initiated Sharon Tate into witchcraft prior um, to her murder. Not that they were necessarily connected. Um, oh, I think you're, are you talking about Alex Sanders? Yeah, Alex Sanders. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I'm digressing, but I mean that was something of a smoking gun because Alex Sanders himself, in interview, said that he was initiated uh, sexually by Crowley when he was, I forget his age 11 or 12 very young anyway prepubescent that's something that's been entirely ignored by by thalamites and whatnot but most of the evidence i present in the book is much more circumstantial and so it depends what we're asking about here so if you mean more examples of what's in magic and theory and practice there's the book of the law itself which prescribed prescribes as in uh, advocates or, or suggests sacrifice of children and that's been dismissed in a similar way as oh that was just meant in code you know if Crowley was just writing in code there's no basis for that argument that I have found Peter Lavender claimed well if you had done the, the study I, I've done and if you'd met the initiates I've met and if you really you know had been inducted into these societies you would know that that's all code but I don't know why he would have to say that rather than just tell me what the code was and 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 how he can how you can prove that that was meant as code, whereas other passages in the book of the law were not. Uh, it's very I think it's very tenuous, if not outright spurious. And yet there are many many examples through Crowley's writings that either advocate or or describe abuse of children, ritual abuse of children. There's a particular magical rite, the Stellae Rubai rite, I believe it's called, that I write about, that does say that children are supposed to be involved in that ritual. Then, of course, there's the infamous passage in the um, the Magical Journal of the Beast that I quote, in which he describes sexually torturing uh, his his infant child, and that's also been dismissed as as just cocaine saturated poetry and the ravings of a you know, a drug ad- addled madman. But again, with no, I mean, okay, you can't present that as evidence or, or certainly not proof that Crowley did, but but to dismiss it without any basis, you know, would be equally rash, I think. So what I try to do with the second part of Ice of Kings is just put all the evidence side by side. And as you know, if you read the book, there's an awful lot of it. I mean, it's almost 200 pages of it. And it varies from Crowley's own behaviors and writings and his personality to the testimonies of others, such as the uh, Robert Bryans, who wrote this book, The Dust Never Settles, which has many allegations about many key figures in British society during the first part of the 20th century, including Evan Tredegar, who's an infamous occultist, a, a peer, you know, a high peer occultist, and his involvement with Crowley. And Brian certainly seems to think, and he was friends, he was, you know, involved in those circles, so he was a witness to some of that stuff. He seems to have no doubt at all that Crowley was involved in, in child sacrifice. And and then there's also the the links that I make to the intelligence agencies and how Crowley was very much embedded in, in that world. Kim Philby was another key player during that time, and how they they may have used Crowley and others like that to create black masses and you know sexual abuse of children and other kinds of sexual uh, indulgence, what have you, as a means to to blackmail people. Like that was an ongoing operation within the intelligence community in Britain, and Crowley was almost certainly involved with that. So then that provides yet another context for Crowley being involved in these kinds of activities, right? So no, there, there's no photographic proof, but what there is proof of is, is that there's this vast body of evidence that's being systematically ignored or at best downplayed or, or dissembled out of existence by all of the primary Crowley scholars and followers and so on. Yeah, I actually interviewed Dr. Richard Kaczynski several months ago about his biography of Crowley and uh, it's a pretty dense book you know I don't remember how long seven eight hundred pages and I don't recall anything in this nature or of this nature in that book so 
No, uh, that that might be an interesting detail uh, that some people have overlooked for sure. And also the intelligence connections are, you know, anytime I, I come across somebody that has those in this, I guess, area of study or, or practice or profession, I have to question that. I have to scrutinize that pretty, pretty heavily. But, you hmm. know, you also have, I mean, you've, you quoted some of Crowley's writings extensively in here. Uh, I just want to share one of them. You said that in Crowley's Confessions, uh, he writes that, quote, the book of the law solves the sexual problem completely. Each individual has an absolute right to satisfy his sexual instinct, as is physiologically proper for him, end quote. That comes from page 874 and 875 of the 1989 version of that book. So, I mean, that quote, you know, uh, (laughs) each individual has an absolute right to satisfy his sexual instinct, as is physiologically proper for him, that's pretty open. I mean, you could interpret that a lot of different ways, couldn't you? Well, yeah, and you, yeah, you, and you, one of them would be do what thou wilt is the whole of the law, basically whatever, you, whatever you know, your temperament leads you towards. Now, the, the uh, defenders of Crowley will say that oh, but elsewhere he says he's very against child abuse and and this, that, and the other, and so Crowley certainly did. You know, as I say in the intro to Vice of Kings, my case against Crowley. I really do just look for the damning evidence. I mean, I do provide some counterpoints, as I'm trying to do now. One could write an 800-page biography of Crowley and make him look like a saint, as has been done. And so there are occasions, certainly, where he said things that would seem to suggest, oh, well, he wouldn't possibly be meaning that, you know, when he makes this kind of statement. But, you know, we would expect a politician or a criminal or a ritual sexual predator to also try and cover their tracks and to say things that would make them appear innocent that that's common sense that they would do that but on the other hand statements that really are very provocative and very dangerous and i would say damning in the context of other things we know about that person such as jimmy savile they they weigh much more heavily it seems that they're much more significant than other statements which would seem to leaven so for example uh, yes, he does on occasion say that children shouldn't be interfered with because that would go against their rights. But he also says that in terms of any any soul, you know, following his will, that could involve that could include murder because it could be a particularly violent star. So, so if he's allowing that the murder isn't an infringement on another person's rights under the right context then he again he, he's really having it both ways and so i think we have to look at crowley's life and the, the charred earth of that life as i do in the book including death of his own children or at least one child who died very young possibly more and you know many of the claims that were made against him about him by people who knew him during that time which have since i mean specifically the time the abbey abbey of Salima which has since been swept under the rug on the pretext that, oh, well, Crowley was, was a shit stirrer and a devil-may-care character, and he fed all of those rumors, and the very purient British press just completely exaggerated it, you know, and, and became hysterical, and therefore none of that stuff should be taken seriously. That, that was the, that's the general sort of context that I found most of this stuff is couched in now- nowadays. So there are some contradictions. You pointed out a couple here, just contradictions in what Crowley himself says about these issues here that we're talking about. You know, maybe the best question to ask is, why should we take him seriously at all, either way? Yeah. Well, yeah, right, exactly. I mean, that's my point with the um, the Crowley joke in that chapter is, well, even if he were joking, everything that we can look at now that we know about the world that we live in and that Crowley was moving in at that time at a very high level politically, socially, in terms of magical societies and, and the arts and all the rest of it. He, w- he was one of the elite, no doubt about it, even though he's been framed as this you know edge, edgy, marginal pioneer. If he, w- if he was moving in that world, he would have known about the things going on that we now know if we've done deep research. He would have known because he was moving in that world. So why would he then make a joke about it? it? Would he really be that irresponsible? And if so, what kind of man was he? Why would he write a text that he would know would be taken seriously, very seriously, by a lot of people? 
and and thereby acted upon, particularly if he you know gained the amount of influence that he wanted to gain and that he predicted he would as the prophet of the new aeon uh, that would be so irresponsible as to be uh, i would say i mean criminal really criminal kind of irresponsibility so to answer the question why would we take someone like that seriously i suppose, to me the answer is is in the same way that one has to take jimmy savile seriously not because they're admirable characters but because they were very very influential and because they are like i use the metaphor that john taylor gatter uses a microchipped eel they were like carriers of a particular culture virus and so if you if you follow their life and their work you can see all the different areas or many of the different areas of our society that are truly toxic and not because they made it toxic but because they were able to move so, so freely within it as carriers of the toxin, you know, they were compatible with it. So, yeah, I mean, Jimmy Savile is part of the, of, of the pop world, which is linked to organized crime, which is linked to progressive politics, which is linked to psychedelia and the counterculture and so on. And Crowley, on his part, you know, was a generation earlier or more, really, maybe two generations earlier. And he was tied in his way to, yes, the budding occult movement, Wicca, again, social engineering, progressive politics, and indeed, you know, a forefather of the uh, counterculture. So, yeah, they're, they're clearly important historical figures, just not, I would say, in the context or the way that we have generally been sold them. The book is called Vice of Kings for a reason, right? So, and to your point there at the end, you know, Crowley obviously uh, found his way onto the Sgt. Pepper album cover that the Beatles put out. That's an interesting placement. You know, I, I mean, like when you just study it historically, the people that are on there to include him there as well uh, is pretty telling, I think, on some level. And speaking mm. of social engineering, you do mention in the book, or you do speculate, I guess, that, that the left-hand path, that term uh, and that way of life, I guess, uh, which is associated with Crowley and occultism, that that may itself be part of the social engineering programs implemented by the Fabian Society and, and groups like that. Why do you think that way? Is there any is there any smoking gun to that, or is that you just speculating that you know because Crowley and all these other guys seem to have these connections that that the left hand path lifestyle or belief system, I guess, or, or practice is part of the social engineering. Well, I think, I mean, there's two answers I could give to start with. One is look at the world we live in, uh, you know, post-counterculture and post-60s, and, you know, how much the path of transgression and the reification or the sovereignty of the individual, of personal preference, of so-called free will, do what thou wilt, uh, the, the will to power slash the pursuit of happiness, uh, how much has that really taken over our culture? And I think in its sort of latest, most, dramatic melodramatic iteration with identity politics where everyone can just be whatever they pretend to be and no one has the right to question it that's a very crowleyan kind of ethos and it does involve what would once have been considered transgression now there are still things that are transgressive in our society that are forbidden by nature but you can see in, in today's society how quickly that changes, like something that's considered forbidden and transgressive may over time, or it may be sort of lingering on the edges of something that is also an orientation that represents the freedom of choice of the individual, depending, you know, there's this moving line, and it harm none, it used to be in Wicca. Well, there's this moving line about consent, what constitutes consent, what constitutes harm. What we consider harmful today is very different from what they considered harmful in the Victorian age, or maybe you could flip that around. Uh, I suppose it's both ways, but certainly things that were considered harmful in the Victorian age, immoral and harmful, are not today, right? There's this constantly moving line. So S&M clubs, you know, they're perfectly socially acceptable today. Pornography is socially acceptable. Things that, that were considered immoral, but also unhealthy and, and detrimental to living, you know, to healthy living, unwholesome. Today they're not. So that's that's the first thing I would kind of use as a, a context or a backdrop for, for my sense that the path of transgression 
is is central to social engineering. The other thing would be that I think that there's a, I think there's an underlying principle, which has to do with manipulation of society. I guess Freud Freud wrote about this, but I haven't actually read it. Totem and Taboo, and how in order to control a society or maintain order within a society, if I put it in a more neutral way, you you have to have taboos. You have to create taboos. But when you create create taboos, you you also, I mean, there's a reverse psychology, like in the in the book of Genesis, that you know, when God forbids the apple, you could say, you know, from our modern perspective, he almost guarantees that they're going to want to eat it. Uh, when children are told not to do something, uh, a lot of the time, you know, certainly if there's some attraction to that thing, it's going to create a tension in the psyche that's very hard to just turn away from it'll keep eating away at them and they'll end up being obsessed with the thing that they're not supposed to do and they may do it just to find relief in their psyche i think there's something in the individual psyche and then also something in society which is that taboos are created to keep people in line but then by that same definition the people who want to stand out as individuals who want to individuate without doing the real self-examination that individuation entails, who want to do it in a more, I suppose, sort of proactive or impulsive fashion, they can do that by breaking taboos. Like there's a tendency, once you create taboos, you create the corresponding tendency to want to break them. And that's the left-hand path, essentially, is that in order to get free of social conditioning and become our true selves in Crowley language, we need to do everything that's forbidden. Because you could say we internalize social norms, we we internalize taboos, and then we are controlled by them internally, so we can't actually be who we are. And so then, in order to get free of that internal program, we have to act out the things that are forbidden. That That's, I think, in essence, the, the path of transgression. And that's certainly what Crowley advocated. And what I looked at with the Fabian Society and their agendas was that a lot of progressive politics seemed to be about this too. It was about pushing the bar in terms of censorship, in terms of sexual expression, sexual freedom, in terms of drug use, and so on. You know, Progressive politics is very much about supposed individual freedom, even though it's ironically, paradoxically, it's also about socialist values. I'm not sure how to reconcile that paradox. So I hope you don't ask me, but the, the, it, maybe it's kind of some of it's laid out there in the book. But in any event, there does seem to be a common thread between the progressive politics of the Fabian society, which which did have its own orientation towards the occult, uh, just not so overtly, as in the overlap with Wicca, which is about nature religions and so on, and full blown occultism that in the West is very, um, I mean, just so much influenced by Crowley and his work that one could almost call it, you know, Crowleyan occultism at this point, I think. Yeah, and, you know, I mentioned this to somebody else recently. I forget where, but I said something like, you know, the, the church and the secret societies and maybe even, you know, governments and corporations on some level have done a great job marketing the occult over the last several decades, or maybe the last several centuries, when you look back at how you were just talking about when you make something taboo or forbidden or put restrictions on people and say you can't do these certain things, it naturally just makes you want to do those things. Or in this case, uh, in terms of like a body of philosophy here or magical practice, it makes you want to seek those out and learn about them and maybe, you know, incorporate them into your life on some level. Because, you know, you get disenchanted, for example, by mainstream religion or the corporatocracy that we live in, you know, or whatever else. But I think that's a point worth making here is that they have done a good job marketing people towards that when they're trying to look for an alternative spiritual approach or alternative philosophies or ways to view the world or that sort of hidden history of the world. Yeah, I think, it, I mean, that is the things like very central to the reverse psychology is you You forbid something, but you make it alluring at the same time. So, yeah, on the one hand, we've had these Christian values that, you know, have been more and more revealed to be oppressive and were oppressive in many ways. 
but running parallel with, you know, if you think about the 50s, parallel with the pushing of Christian values or the, you know, the assertion that they were the right values, there was, there was more and more of this is a sort of pop culture that was showing the other side and often it would show it in this supposedly dark light as, a, as if a warning. But at the same time, it would make it very alluring. And I mean, I thought this about Reefer Madness recently that that could very well have been deliberately engineer a kind of deliberate campaign to get young people smoking pot all those reefer madness movies you know because they made it seem very absurd the moralism seemed absurd because it was just so hysterical and overwrought while at the same time they were showing these parties that were meant to be horrifying but actually were kind of probably pretty appealing to those kids in the 50s right so you could say that about the occult as well like they've been or the media and the culture has been presenting the occult or was for for decades in this this supposedly dark and forbidding way, but at the same time, within the context of a rather sterile religious society that wasn't satisfying the ids of of the youth, and and thereby making it actually rather appealing. And and the other thing I think here is is that very important is that I mean, if you think about the Book of Genesis. It says, thou shalt, don't eat the fruit, right? But it doesn't say why. Or if it does, it says, don't eat the fruit, you'll be as gods. <laughs> right? Okay. Yeah. So I, I must have missed a bit where I, I'm actually supposed to not want to eat it. You know what I mean? Like there's, there's no information about why this is a bad idea. It's kind of like either it's a bad idea just because we tell you or it's a bad idea because, uh, and then the reason given is, isn't that off-putting? It's actually quite attractive. And I think you could see that with the occult, that it's either been forbidden by rather ignorant Christians who haven't really experienced the allure of the occult, they just have accepted the, the dogma that it's of the devil, and so they're not very persuasive, or it's forbidden in a way that it is more informed, but still the things that are being shared about the occult make it attractive. And what, what I've been trying to do in the past few years, and most of it with Vice of Kings is really look at what the occult path entails, where it leads, and you know, I suppose to to not take a moral position on it, but try and try and approach it in a very pragmatic sense, like a, like a like you would a food, like what's this food, like GMO or something, like rather than just assume oh GMO must be bad because it's corporations and it's technology and, and blah de blah actually look at the constitution and what happens when you genetically modify organisms and what the effects it has on the nervous system. I, I don't, I'm not actually an expert on this, but I'm just using it as an easy example. What's the constitution of the, of the product, so to speak, or the ideology? And how does that constitution, once it's ingested, thereby reconfigure our, our own constitution? And then, and where does that lead? So, so that's what I map in Vice of Kings. And that's why I, include my own story because uh, I'm the beyond even Jimmy Savile or Crowley I'm the the frog that's being dissected in the laboratory of my writing to see you know if these things I ingested if they were toxic and if so what what effects they had on my nervous system you know what what's my blood like now you know how how, how what percentage of my blood is now you know alcohol so to speak or, or Crowley Hall, and um, well, I mean, it's up to people to decide. But I felt I was quite shocked looking at my own life in the context of this other stuff, my childhood, uh, my family connections, and then Crowley, who, who, as you know, impacted me. How much it shaped my thoughts and behaviours, and directed them down quite self-destructive and even destructive to others' uh, path, a path of those behaviours that that really, um, they didn't, they gave me a sense of being empowered and a sense of, of transforming myself, but it didn't last. And it, and it culminated in, as I say, some, some borderline psychotic and, and quite overtly destructive behaviors. So, so that's the best I can do really, after I've looked at the evidence of the actual writing and the philosophies and the behaviors of, of those cultural figures themselves is just say, well, okay, now let's look at me. You know, it, it doesn't mean that this is going to affect everyone the way it affects me, but it's still 
it's the best case study I have. It's the most honest, and it's still got to signify something. You know, it's it's like uh, we are somewhat different, but more or less, if we ingest the same Big Mac, it's going to affect our bodies in more or less the same ways. I I think so. Yeah, and a couple points there. Just, uh, I mean, I agree with most of what you said there. You know, especially the uh, the GMO analogy, like. And just translate that to belief systems, you know, it's important that you question your own belief systems while you have them and then look for the potential areas of toxicity, like where they may be holding you back, hurting you, hindering you, making you unhealthy on some level. And then also, I love that Genesis analogy. I mean, in this sense, anything could be a forbidden fruit. It's not it's not like knowledge or wisdom or, you know, something as abstract as that. It, It could be, you know, something like sex or you know, just don't play outside in the street at night, Johnny, right? So, I mean, there's all these things that you could just label as a forbidden fruit that could lure you to those sorts of behaviors or ideas. So I want to ask you about Timothy Leary, too. You mentioned him in this section, the second section of the book. He publicly expressed his admiration for Aleister Crowley. And Leary's also a guy who's long been thought to have CIA ties, I don't know if those have ever been substantiated, but the speculation is there. I and, think and they have, you know, I, I, have? when okay. I wrote that book, I thought they hadn't, but since then I've found in one of Jim Keith's books, will control and another book that, that Leary actually, uh, he actually acknowledged it openly. So that was a bit of a surprise to me because I also thought it was, it was somewhat speculative, but apparently he, he openly admitted it. Okay. Well, that's okay. So that I don't know if that changes my question, but I, I was just curious. You know, like he was sort of um, I don't want to call him a figurehead, but he was definitely a, a pretty influential person in that '60s counterculture. You know, with his tune in, turn on, drop out. But you know, I also pull his think for yourself, question authority line. I put that at the end of every show here. So on some level, yeah. like okay, I think that's good advice. But on, on some other level, maybe I have been you know socially engineered to spew that sort of stuff out of my mouth for whatever reason. So. I just say I'm curious. I haven't really talked to anybody about Tim Leary or his contributions to this counterculture and more specifically why he cited Crowley as an influence. So I'm just curious if you could, you know, maybe just parse that out for us briefly. Well, I'm I'm not that up on Timothy Leary, but I mean, I was talking on another podcast recently about the correlation between Havelock Ellis and Alfred Kinsey, both of whom I write about in the book, and they were both sexologists. And And there seemed to be an echo effect there, like Ellis was a precursor to Kinsey, and you could see how Ellis influenced, he influenced Nabokov and thereby the writing of Lolita. So he had this very profound cultural influence, which was to do, again, with the path of transgression, freedom of expression of sexuality. And then it's like there was this second iteration via Kinsey, who, who in passing was a admirer of Crowley and I think bought some of the Crowley diaries and made a visit, pilgrimage to the Abbey of Thelema, and and so on. But my point here is rather that I think it's similar with Crowley and Leary. Now, Leary actually literally claimed to be the reincarnation of Crowley, although he he literally claimed it, but he couldn't have literally believed it because I think he was born, he would have been born uh, before Crowley died. But the meaning is, uh, I think, fairly clear that he felt as though just as Crowley believed about himself and a life as Levi, that he was continuing the work that Crowley had begun. And so I suppose, uh, I mean, consciousness expansion was more Leary's bag than sex magic. So it's not quite so obvious in terms of the interest of Leary as compared to the interest of Crowley. But what does seem very clear as is that, as I touched on already, that both figures were central to the emergence of the counterculture, which, well, I mean, it was a huge movement, obviously. Like it was the whole of society went through a period of destabilization and transformation. But what it transformed into, of course, was very, very different to that which the counterculture themselves, the individuals within it, imagined that they were bringing about, the sexual revolution, ditto. And I think that, I mean, with with both cases, what I hypothesize, but I also think 
find quite a lot of evidence for both Leary and Crowley that they they assumed the guise of being these rebellious outlaw figures who were representing the alienated, disenfranchised youth and offering them means of self-empowerment, means of identification, you know, self-discovery, and so on, that would thereby create a movement that would transform society. But in actual fact, Crowley was very much working with, and I would say even for, the ruling class and the elite. He was one of them. It only appeared that he was a rebel because he, I think he was overtly expostulating the more secret or clandestine practices and philosophies of the elite. So he was introducing it to the masses. And in that sense, you could say there was a genuine rebellious aspect to that because there might have been some factions within the controlling elite that didn't want that stuff to be revealed. But I think there are indisputably others that did and that, that knew that this was a means of social engineering and that Crowley was, was you know, working with that agenda. And ditto with Leary and, and LSD. Now, if Leary has, uh, if he openly admitted to working for the CIA, and maybe I, I'll find you the link and you can put it in the show notes, what he claimed was, yeah, well, most of what I was doing was just what they told me to. But, you know, the sort of, the, the opinion about that was that Leary was still a loose cannon, that the CIA kind of didn't know what they'd had or what they'd unleashed, and ditto with LSD. You know, there are people to this day who think that the CIA and co, the social engineers, were just naive about LSD and didn't realize that it would actually liberate people. They thought that it would have this other effect and it backfired. Well, I don't personally think that's true. I think it did have, ex well, maybe not exactly, but more or less the effect that was intended. And that Leary was also sticking to the plan and maybe having it both ways to some extent. I mean, he was a human being. I'm sure he had his good points and his bad points, and parts of him probably did want to, you know, rebel against whatever orders he was being given it's impossible to say isn't it one can only really look at the you know the affiliations and the agendas that he was embedded within and then the effects of of his life and of the movement that he helped create so i mean my sense is with that is is that a lot of it i mean one of the my, major principles that work with both crowley and leary and i touched on this in part one of Vice of Kings with the progressive schools and how they mixed up Freud with Red Indians. And basically they were talking about how to unleash the id, sort of tap into the primal aspect of people's psyche as a way to liberate them. But that if you do that prematurely, such as via psychedelics or sex magic, in quotes, what will happen is a kind of derangement. And again, I can present my own life as an, as a, an example of that. Like I, I did uh, practice a lot of these methods and philosophies and so on, and it did unleash a great deal of psychic energy, and, and, and it did feel incredibly liberating and empowering for a period. But what followed that period uh, was massive, or what, uh, rather what was congruent with that period was, was actually massive ego inflation that I didn't recognize at the time, followed by a massive burnout in which I felt like an empty shell who was unable even to just live an ordinary life. Fortunately, I did come through that, and I feel that it was all a learning <laughs> curve for me. But had I persisted as someone like Crowley or Leary or many of them more devoted followers have persisted you know, for, for decades rather than for, well, a couple of decades, I guess I persisted, so still pretty long. But if I persisted in another decade, let's say, I don't think I would have come through it. I think, like my brother, I would have simply combusted, you know, gone down in a in a, in a blaze of sordid glory. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've always been of the opinion that if there was any real, authentic counterculture that sprung up in the '60s that it was quickly infiltrated by social engineers or intelligence agencies or both. You know, it's probably the same groups that we're talking about here. But the more that I 
I don't know, I guess the more I step back and look at it and look at all the connections that a lot of these people had that were part of those movements, like maybe there were true authentic anti-Vietnam protesters, you know, but I think once you got into the sexual revolution and the psychedelic movement that those seemed to come a bit later than the Vietnam mm. stuff, but also that, <laughs> that that right there, I think, has laid the groundwork for where for the kind of world that we live in now, where you see now people wanting to legalize psychedelics across the world. You see the sexual liberation, quote unquote, that's taking place here where, you know, with like things like gender fluidity and it just seems like that, that, that those seeds were planted not to ripen in the moment there, but definitely maybe down the line with future generations. And it just feels like we're living in a, a sort of socially engineered spectacle at the moment. Yeah, it certainly does. And, and I think I think one, one way to simplify it, it's just occurring to me now, but there certainly have been repressive periods in history, no doubt about it, and and they're not healthy. So what was going on with the Fabian Society in the early 1900s and then later uh, in the 1960s was a reaction against unnatural repression. But it seems as though, as human beings, we're very susceptible to, well, to be misled, and that if you've been repressed and you're self-repressed, and and then you're being invited to get free of that. You're very susceptible to temptation, like, okay, so now I can let all my hair hang out, now I can do whatever I want. And it's like the pendulum swings the other way. And so then people can very easily be lured into or maybe just naturally gravitate into excess expression. And and I think that's the pendulum just keeps swinging back from one extreme to the other, doesn't it? Rather than recognizing that if we can just lift the repressions and not do anything, you know, <laughs> to not celebrate it and not test the boundary, just, just see what it's like to just let the re- repression dissolve and then let the life force emerge gradually and slowly and 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 let us know what it wants to express without repression rather than immediately jump to the other extreme and say in order to get free of repression i'm going to celebrate this orientation or this identification that seems to be what we always do and i think it 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 just um in both cases you have a, a misuse of the life force in the first case you're suppressing it and in the second case you're indulging it but in, in neither case is the life force actually getting to 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 flow the, the way that it wants to flow and show us the way to go. And that, that's what doesn't happen, I think. Yeah. Before we get too far away from this subject, too, you mentioned Wicca a couple times earlier, and I wanted to just sort of parse out some details from that as well. So I think it's probably best to explain to people what is the order of woodcraft chivalry and what is their connection to the founding of Wicca, and also to Aleister Crowley. Right. Well, I should have my own book in front of me now or some sort of chart because, as you know, there's so many connections. I built this huge chart while I was working on Occult Yorks and so many names that it's impossible for me to keep them all in mind, so maybe you can help me. But I know Edward Carpenter was a key figure. Edward Carpenter was a Fabian. And, you see, I mean, initially the Fabian Society was the Order of New Life, uh, which itself has a kind of wicker feel to it, and and then it changed to this more sort of more intellectual name, the Fabian Society. But as I say, Havelock Ellis, Frank Podmore, they were both early Fabians. Frank Podmore was a spiritualist, and Ellis was a sexologist. So there was definitely already this this central aspect to the Fabian movement of again the primal, unleashed libido, unleashed id. And uh, certain correlations there with with getting back to nature and even nature worship, archetypal identification and so on. So anyway, Edward Carpenter and Westlake, these are the two names that come to mind. But I'm going to boulderize it by trying to make it very exact in terms of historically. But they were involved in the, the, the Order of Woodcraft. And the Order of Woodcraft, I mean, it had some interesting different interest because it was also very closely associated and this is where my uh, connection to my grandfather i mean this is how i ended up looking at this because of the connection to my grandfather uh, to richard ackland and the commonwealth which was a 
political party that George Orwell was was quite suspicious of. I mean, he was hopeful for it because it was supposedly socialism, but he also felt it had the makings of a new fascist movement. So he was keeping his eye on it for a period. And the Commonwealth were very into this social research, which is central to you know, what I map in, in part one of Vice of Kings around uh, Wilfred Bine and Wilfred Trotter, crowd psychology, and they, well, various different uh, researches that were done around the seemingly psychic element when crowds, if you're observing crowds working together, it seemed as though they functioned somehow as this living organism, not just the individuals within it, but collectively there was a kind of collective energy and consciousness that could be observed in these groups. And that this, the potential of that collective energy was transcended that of any of the individuals or of any group, that it had this psychic dimension. They wouldn't have used the word psychic, but definitely used, they definitely refer to what we would think of as a psychic component, just in more obscure language. And, and Commonwealth seemed to be interested in applying some of these principles for social organization. And they came up with these two categories of individuals. One was the sensitive and the other was, I forget, like I said, it's too much in, information, but, and also they changed the terms, but there was one that was more of the more sensitive type that was more of an innovative. And then there was the more stable type that was more of a crowd person, you know, just a person who went along with the, the herd. And the, so they were looking into different ways to exploit, if you will, or employ these these principles to get groups to function in the best possible ways. And this was part of the progressive schooling that was coming up in, in the in this period in the early, I guess in the thirties. And another part of it was and this was connected to the progressive schools, including one I went to called Abbott's Home, was the camping movement. And the Order of Woodcraft Chivalry, I think it was called, was kind of like an adult Boy Scouts, I suppose. And they were invo- they were interested in creating a camping movement that involved survival in, in, in the wild, but also a ritualistic element, you know, dancing and performing and worship and wearing masks and carving weapons and i don't know all the specifics but so that that began as more of a political and an educational thing i believe than any kind of religious thing or alternate religious but it coincided with and evolved simultaneously with the the wicker movement which is gerald gardner who was associated with westlake and, and edward carpenter and of course gardner was closely affiliated with Crowley, and Crowley even, I believe, wrote some of the rituals. He was certainly a key influence within the creation of Wicca. So although he wasn't, Crowley wasn't obviously affiliated with these uh, progressive political movements around the Commonwealth and the Order of Woodcraft, he was involved with the Wiccan thing, which was, I don't know if it would be right to call it an offshoot, but it's, it's quite hard to map backwards from our point in time because Wicca, nobody's heard of Commonwealth, nobody's heard of the Order of Woodcraft, I can't even remember the exact name, and everybody knows what Wicca is. Like Wicca's the movement that took took off, right, and is now so prevalent in our society. Like I, we run a thrift store, two of our employees are, are involved in Wicca, well, one of them overtly and the others maybe not so much, but just a, a psychic with an interest in those things, and that's two out of four, and it's not because, well, I suppose it is partly because we attract weirdos, but I think it's also because it's just so prevalent now. You know, being a witch has become an alternate religion. In fact, I think it's just, uh, I think I was reading something recently about it uh, being promoted as as a genuine uh, budding new religion, not that it's new, but that it's gaining momentum again in society. But anyway, sorry if that, that was a bit all over the place, but hopefully I more or less answered your question. Yeah, I think you did. And I'm I'm wondering, though, now, is there anything in Wicca that you know of? Uh, and if you don't know of it, that's fine. But is there anything in Wicca that that we could, I don't know, interpret as a uh, a favorable stance towards some of the things that we were talking about throughout the first hour here in terms of 
ritual sexual abuse? Like, are Wiccans, or these early Wiccan groups, are they advocating for that? Well, again, this is an area where various different parts of society or different movements intersect because you've got the progressive schooling, as they say, with their camping movements, but that also involved, yeah, back to nature, and so that also involved, or at least advocated, nudity, right? So, and that would have been children, depending on, you know, which age children were going to school. Like the one I went to, it didn't start till 11, but in any case... And we certainly didn't run around naked. So I'm not sure how effective that uh, agenda was in terms of actually implementing nudity in schools. But I just use it as an example. Then there was the, I mean, there was the thing I cite in in, uh, Germany with the um, Kinderladen, kid love schools that were for um, sexually initiating children in the 50s in Germany supposedly as a way to liberate to create a liberated society this was this was uh, a marxist or a quasi marxist kind of attitude that in order for to liberate people socially you have to liberate them sexually and to do that you should start with the children uh, that's very crowley esque and then uh, so then with wicca well yes of course they are about nudity and i mean both crowley and charles manson not that Manson was was Wiccan exactly, but I think they were witches. They were very clear, I think, about letting children be uh, exposed to adult sexuality. Included in it might be stretching it. Certainly, we know that Crowley wanted children to to witness the sexual acts of adults for there not to be any secrecy around them. We don't know for sure that he... He would have included them, ditto with Manson. I don't even know if there were any children within the Manson family. But in any event, so Wicca, I mean, how I see it and how I try and describe it in Vice of Kings is is that it's back to this id again. If you unleash the id without creating the right context for it, then um, all hell's going to break loose, particularly after a period of repression. Because, you know, if you repress sexual energy for, for generations, then when it finally does come out, if the context isn't created whereby it can be contained, then it's going to want to compensate for, it's like the devil, you know, in the pit. He's there for a thousand years, and when you let him out, he's sure is going to be angry. That's kind of the point. So I think that there was a lot of naivete going on here. I don't think that we have to be so uh, cynical as to think that you know, every movement that was about back to nature or nudity or being free love or anything was was somehow a hiding place for pedophiles, although quite likely they would have found it quite quickly. It, it can just be a question of well-meaning but very naive people who do a clear sense, well, not a clear sense, but a strong sense that sexual shame is unhealthy and crippling and that we need to be more free and open about it. But that things get out of hand very quickly. And I think that that's the case with Wicca and something as seemingly harmless as as nudity of adults and children together celebrating being part of nature and also of occultism in general, that if one stays at the thin end of the wedge of occultism, one has, yes, nature, uh, enjoyment even. I wouldn't say it doesn't have to be worship, just, just being in nature communing with nature one has astrology which seems quite a benign sort of discipline and so on right there's there's quite a lot there at that thin end which seem not just harmless but quite productive and and uh, positive but if you well i suppose once you open that door (laughs) you you have to be aware that what makes these things powerful is is that they're They have resonance with the deepest aspects of our unconscious being. And so, and and there's an awful lot of trauma down there in those deep parts. So once you start releasing the Kundalini or the energy of the id or the unconscious or the life force, uh, it's going to stir up the trauma. And then that's going to create a lot of anxiety. And then people become deranged and not necessarily being aware of it they may not be aware that they're deranged just as i wasn't aware they will compensate the anxiety by trying to 
harness that life force to empower them. You know, they won't be interested in freedom so much as power and control because the anxiety is so great. And so then they will become pro progressively more abusive. And that, I think that's what I'm at with Crowley. Well, not to make this about me, but I had an experience just recently, a few weeks ago, that I, I was confronted by a past trauma, essentially, and it led me to a place of extreme anxiety. Like, all that just came up to the surface, and I did feel deranged. I, I acted really just not myself for several days. I, I felt like I was somebody else for that time. And uh, mm. so, I mean, I resonate with a lot of what you're saying there. There's an awfully delicate balance that you have to find in this stuff. And I'm, I'm searching for it still, I think. But uh, I do appreciate you taking the time here again to go through the second part of the book here, The Vice of Kings. Please do tell people, Jason, where they can find the book if they're interested. They can find the book by going to my website, Be Simplest. That's auticulture, A-U-T-I culture.com. And they can just order it there through the publishers. Or I suppose they can go to Amazon if they want to. And um, I just mentioned that it's a third in a trilogy with Seen and Not Seen and Prisoner of Infinity, which Ryan and I also talked about. And I just also mentioned The, the Limitless, which is the weekly podcast that I do also at uh, my website. Absolutely, man. Well, Jason Horsley, thanks again for stopping by on short notice. We just put this together in the last few days. So I do appreciate you making the time, man. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. I appreciate you giving me the time. And there you have it. My thanks again to Jason Horsley. That rounds out a trifecta of shows with him that date back to last summer. Honestly, his books are worth a read, if anything. You may not agree with all or much of what he says, but that doesn't mean his research or his perspective should be dismissed. Ultimately, he's just asking questions and trying to find answers. And really, I think we all can relate to that. And you know, I mentioned a uh, traumatic experience that I had recently, which I don't want to harp on at length here because I also talked about it somewhat at the end of the last episode with Nikki Weird, and frankly, I'm sick of talking about trauma. But I do want to add on to something Jason said in this chat that's sort of related, though. He said that his own pursuit of occultism led to massive ego inflation, followed by burnout, and then feeling like an empty shell of himself. And I think that also describes my path here as well, and very much what I'm feeling like right now. And I haven't really even pursued occultism to any real depths, you know, just through some light research and conversation here. But I've absolutely had to check my ego along the way, and once I consciously began to do that, which actually I think I'm still doing it on some level, but once I began to do that, that burnout did creep in, and I'm in that empty shell phase. And, you know, not that that's inherently... A negative experience, although it, it does feel like that at times, but it's not all bad. It's part of the journey, the darkness before the dawn, I guess. But that does make me wonder, you know, what I will do with myself when that sun does rise. Like, will an outlet like this continue to, to feel necessary? I guess only time will tell, right? Anyway, Jason did make some good points, positive points, about Crowley and the left-hand path in the Patreon extension, so it wasn't all in the same vein as the free part of the chat. And in that extension, we talked about returning to nature and nature worship, sex magic and gender and sexuality liberation, uh, more about pedophilia in the DSM-5, the influence of primitivism on Crowley and the Fabian Society, and whether conversations like this help or hinder the normalization of behaviors. Uh, and a shout out to new patrons, Michael, Chad, Dan, Yvonne, Aaron, and Neil. Thanks so much for boarding the esoteric endeavor. Never know how many trips are left on these tracks. So if you want to support and help keep this thing chugging along, patreon.com slash occulture is the place to do such things. I should also note that fuck, I overworked myself to the point of burnout last year. In addition to the the personal, you know, psychological and emotional shit we all deal with. And episodes have been a bit slower to release than has been typical for me, so my apologies for that, but, you know, I gotta get healthy, I gotta make time for me and the people I love and care about, and with a full-time job on top of this, like, it's just hard to balance all this most days. I've also been writing a short story, which has taken up some of my free time as well, and I actually need to go try to finish that. Uh, which means another entry in the Occulture canon is complete, 
There are some exciting entries ahead too, so be sure to hit that subscribe button. Uh, Recluse is coming back very soon. So too is Gordon White, if his circumstances permit. And so too is Douglas Rushkoff a few weeks from now. In addition, of course, to a nice variety of first-time guests as well. So until next time, you've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. Oh.